Now let's get started with analysis. First, connect to the server. The server I'm going to connect is Linux-based. Therefore, from a Windows desktop, I need to use some tools allowed for SSH, SSH connection. If you are using a Mac or Linux machine, simply open the terminal and use the SSH, SSH command. Here, I use the SSH secure file transfer client. It has a user interface on Windows. First, I create a quick connect. Type in the server name and your username and leave the port number as default. Click connect and it will prompt to ask you for the, for the password. Um, type your password and wait for login. Once it's connected, the server we will see the server on the right side. So now change the path to where your RNA seq files are. I put them in the cookbook folder. Here we can see the FASTQ files, one for each sample. Now count at G1, G2, G3, and while type from G1 to G3. To make it easier to edit the file, I will open the terminal window also connected to the server. Go to Window and click New Terminal, we will get Terminal Environment instead of a User Interface window. I've changed the path to the same folder and we can see the same files. Now notice that the FASTQ files are compressed in the GZ format, therefore we need to uncompress it. In Linux, use the G unzip command to unzip um, any compressed files, and we can use the star annotation to indicate all files that are ends with uh, .gz. Now go ahead and hit enter, it'll start uncompressing all the gz files. It'll take from half an hour to a few hours depends on how big is your data. And I've prepared a data set, so we'll skip the waiting time. So I put these two FASTQ files in the data set uh, subdirectory. As we can see here, we have now crowd and well type. Now I want to take a look at the first few lines, type help, uh, head. So everything looks fine. Now we can move to the top uh, the top hat shell script. So in general, to use any software installed on the server, we need to write a, a script containing the commands and submit a script to the server. We can either write the script on the server using a terminal or prepare the script on a local desktop and transfer to the server. If you are a frequent user, I suggest to use the text editor and writing the script on the server since it's easier to edit and debug. Uh, most of it comes with nano or v slash vim. It's a very uh, old text editor but works very well on the Linux system. Let's look at the script using vim. Type vim and the name of the file in the terminal. The editor will open in the same window. The first line indicates this is a shell script. It's almost the same for all shell scripts and depends on the shell, it could be bash or sh or uh, other name of the shell and it is required. The next a few lines of code are called PBS codes it is used to submit a job to the server. You can specify the name of the job, uh, what type is the job, here uh, the queue parameters, and the job, the type of this job is expressed, and also how many hours you require you request to run the job, and the next tool to indicate where to store the standard output and standard error. So it depends on the server, the queue parameters can be different. For example, 
If I go to the home page of my server, hpc.ssm.edu, I can find the queue uh, information down here. So here we have all different types of queues, uh, job types, the small, the medium, or even GPU. It depends on the type of job you, you want to run. Some of them requires a lot of computing units. Some, some of them requires a lot of memories. And here I use this express is for debugging and quick testing. The advantage of using the express job is that it got higher priority in the job queue, but it limits the time uh, to only two hours. So when you first submit a job, you want to test if everything works fine. If after two hours everything looks fine, then we can change the queue to um, any job types you want and then submit the real job. And the next chunk of line are developed from my server. It's to load the necessary uh, software. For example, Topad will be using Bowtie and Sound Tools. And therefore, in addition to Topad, I also need to upload these two. You better contact your server admin team or read your server documentation since these, uh, these lines are different from server to server. Now let's move to the actual top hat command. This is the only command line you need if you're running top hat on a local desktop. No shell script, no PBS, no module load is uh, needed. This is the only thing you need to run top hat. So let's look at the parameters. Here I'm showing the minimum setting for parameters keeping everything else default. Um, top Hat 2 uses top, uh, Bowtie 2 as default to align the short reads. Um, we can also change it to Bowtie 1 since it's more stable. The P parameters specify the number of threads uh, Top Hat will be using. Uh, 16 is good for server. If you're running on a local desktop, you can use 2 or 4 or 8, depends on how many computing units you have. The capital G parameter requires the, uh, the path to the genome annotation file. Uh, this is a preview file we can found on the website of Bowtie. But to, uh, to tell the server where to find it, we have to give the full path. So now let's go to the Bowtie homepage, scroll down, and we can find these previewed indexes. And here we will be using the mouse MMI uh, genome build. Click, it'll start downloading the files. It's a pretty large file, so we'll skip skip the downloading here. And um, I've already put them in the server. In this, I'll put it in. i put them in the genome subdirectory. So the full path requirement may not be uh, true for all servers. Again, you need to check. Uh, the next O parameter specify which folder to put all the top hat output. And the next parameter is the actual sequence of the mouse genome. If we look at the files top hat uses, it's actually a bunch of files uh, broken down but with the same prefix MMI as we can see here. So when we're giving this uh, parameter, Top Hat will look for anything here in this folder start with MF9. And the very last thing is the FASTQ file, the actual RNAseq seq data file we have. Um, at the end, I put a greater than sign. It's not necessary for local desktop. Since the server doesn't generate on-screen print as the job progresses, I use the greater sign to redirect the on-screen print to a log file. It's useful to check the log file if error happens. If you're running on a local computer, you can also save the on-screen uh, print to a log file. Now we can go ahead and save this script. To submit the job, we need to make it executable. Uh, remember which command to use to change the, uh, to change the file to executable? Yeah, it's chmod. So type chmod-x followed by the name of the script. It'll be executable now. And we can go ahead and submit it using the qsub uh, command. As soon as we submit the job, 
a unique job ID is generated. And we can use the QStep command to check the status of the job. Here we can see the job ID, the username, um, the queue as we specify with the queue parameter, and the job name we specify with the M parameter, and also uh, the resources it's using, the times we the time we required. Um, the S column shows the status of the job. Right now it's queue, it means queuing. As it's running, it can be an R. Uh, stand for running, or if it's completed, it will be C, means uh, completed. So uh, we'll skip this, uh, this part and go ahead to look at the output files. Here is what Top Hat gives us as output. So the accepted uh, underscore heat uh, BAM file contains the alignment for all mapable shortcuts. It is also a file that couplings take. There is also an unmapped BAM file that collects all reads that are not mapped. Sometimes it's useful to go back to this file and see if we can add back some sequences if the mapping rate is too low. There are also this deletion, insertions, and junctions bed file that contains sequences that map to these to these regions. One more thing that would that worth looking at is the log files. Let's go ahead and go to the logs folder. Top hat generates a lot of log files as it's running. The most informative one is this top hat.log file. Um, it, sh it shows a summary as top hat is running. For example, at the beginning a first checks if all necessary softwares are loaded. Here we can see Bowtie and SAM tools. And then it, it's checking if the reference genome data is available. For example, it's checking the FASTA files. Um, and then it shows you the information as its progress. So if um, in the debugging process, if you found some error happens, you can go back to this log file and usually top hat will give information of what kind of error is it at the end of this log file. Um, if you need to learn more about top hat and its parameters, go to the top hat website. It has a full list of the parameters and the usage. Now we have the knockout aligned. We can repeat the step with wild type. Once both alignments are done, we can start to construct the transcriptome using uh, cufflinks. Remember, we don't have replicate. We can combine the transcriptome construction and DEGN's identification into one step using cufdiff. Again, um, we need to submit the job via a shell script. Here is a prompt for a shell script, followed by PBS code, and then next is the, uh, the module code to load the software. Again, all these codes are not needed for a local desktop. And this is the only uh, command line you need to type on the, on the desktop. So let's first invoke cupdiff and the P parameter uh, specify the number of threads we'll be using and the O parameter specify the output folder to hold um, the files generated by Cuffdiv. And the next parameter is the genome uh, annotation file, the same one as we used it for Top Hat. Um, the next two BAM files are uh, from the Top Hat output for, uh, for WildTap at G1 and Knockout at G1. Uh, remember, we need to put them in the correct order. So uh, well tab in the beginning and now followed by knockout. Otherwise, the comparison between um, differential expression will be flipped. Again, at the end, I use this redirection sign to uh, write the on-screen print to a log file. Now we save it, and we can change it to executable and submit to the server. It usually takes from a few hours to um, up to one day or two day. It usually finishes within one day. It depends on uh, the size of your file. But it shouldn't be more than two days if you're running on the server.
Now let's look at the output of CovDiv. It generates a bunch of div files and FPKM tracking files. And if we have replicates, it will also generate some other tracking files such as group tracking files. So the div files uh, contains the differentially expressed CDS or uh, genes or isoforms and promoters and also the transcripts. The FPKM tracking files contain the detailed information of the uh, of the transcriptional measure for these genes or CDS or isoforms. If we go to the website of Cufflinks, we can find a detailed description of all these output files and the fields slash columns in these output files. Scroll down to output files, we can see um, FPKM files, count tracking files, Regroup group tracking files, uh, differential expression test, etc., etc. Um, and it has a description of each of the columns. Now, let's since we are interested in the differential expressed genes, let's take a look at this gene uh, underscore x dot file. So in the first line, it gives the uh, the name for each column. We have these test ID, genes, samples, status, and value 1 and value 2. Um, since we didn't give the name of each value, so we will have Q1, Q2 here. And this status means uh, if there is a statistical test done for the genes in these two samples, if is, what's the status? And then this value 1 and value 2 corresponds to sample 1 and sample 2. Is the FPKM uh, for these two uh, for this specific gene in the two different samples? The FPKM is a normalized value, normalized by the length of the region of interest. Uh, next, we have the log two of the full change uh, test that p value, q value, and significant. The significant column gives us the information of either the differential of whether the differential expressed is significantly um, is statistically significant or not. So as we can see here, this is no means the differential the, the the expression difference is not significantly different. By default, uh, CovDiv will use Q value equal to or less than 0 0.05 as the default threshold of calling yes or no. So how to get the all differentially expressed genes from the output? Remember the powerful Linux command grab. Now we can grab yes from this file. Now it show up here on the window. We can see that we already get all genes that are significantly differentially expressed. We can also redirect this print to a file. Let's call it dgenes.txt, and it's here. So open it in Vim. We can see we have all these genes that are significantly differentially expressed. Now I want to show you a bonus command. It's called wc-l, followed by the name of the file. It'll give you the number of lines in the file. So now we know there are 524 genes that are differentially expressed between knockout and well type in at the G1 time point. All right. The last thing I want to show you is to identify is to do a time series comparison. Um, remember, we have three time points. So. If we want to identify differentially expressed genes in the wild type animal at different time points, again we write a shell script to sub to submit a job, and we have the, the shell uh, the shell script prompt, the PBS, the modules, and the only difference is to use an extra parameter capital T 
to, to tell Kafdiv that this is a time series comparison. And also when we're giving the BAM files, we have to put them in the correct order of the time points. Here we have the G1 and G2 and G3. It's very simple. Now go ahead and save it and we do the same. We uh, change it to executable and submit it to the server. So in this lecture, I've showed you how to align the RNA-seq grids to the reference genome, construct the transcriptome, and identify differentially expressed genes. Thanks for watching. We will continue the pipeline in the next lecture.